Between 1870 and 1900, Fargo grew from a few tents and small frame buildings on the west bank of the Red River to a thriving city of 9,500 people. It survived economic upheavals, a fire which destroyed much of the business district, and a flood which inundated much of the town. Life in Fargo during that period was lively, varied, and sometimes surprisingly sophisticated. During the late 1800s up until about 1890, Fargo served as head of navigation on the Red River. This sketch by William Rogers, which appeared in Harper's Weekly in 1881, depicts typical riverbank activities, an immigrant with his covered wagon, a land agent, a grain elevator, boat building activities, and the steamboat Grandin. The Anson Northrop, first steamboat on the Red River, left Fort Abercrombie bound for Winnipeg in May 1859. By the 1870s, steamers were traveling between Fargo-Moorhead and Winnipeg on a regular schedule. Passengers and freight arrived in Fargo by rail and continued north on steamboats, barges, or flatboats. The lumber-laden flatboat in the foreground was one of many built here. The flatboat was floated downstream to Winnipeg with a steersman at the tiller oar, then dried out and used for lumber. In August 1880, a newspaper reported that the Pluck was leaving for Winnipeg with her 18 cabins and two staterooms filled, with additional passengers quartered in the deck. Her two large barges and one lighter barge carried three carloads of threshing machines, two and a half carloads of wagons, five carloads of lumber, one carload of portable engines, two carloads of pork, one carload of salt, one carload of plows, and five carloads of miscellaneous freight. The Grandin Elevator, owned by the Grandin Bonanza Farm, stood on the riverbank between Northern Pacific Avenue and the Northern Pacific Tracks. Wheat was moved upriver from the Grandin Farms in Trail County on Grandin Line steamers and barges, stored in the elevator, and shipped by rail out to Fargo. By 1890, railroad expansion doomed navigation on the Red, and within a few years, it was a thing of the past. In May 1871, the Northern Pacific Railway secretly selected the point where the railroad would cross the Red River, determining the site of a new city. The small settlement there was known as Centralia, but in 1872 the post office approved the name Fargo. The Northern Pacific selected the name to honor a director, William G. Fargo, who was also a founder of the Wells Fargo Express. The first train, decked in flowers, entered Fargo in June 1872, shortly after completion of the railroad bridge crossing the river. This image is a railroad bridge looking toward Fargo, 1879. The long high trestle on the Fargo side was necessary because of the uneven, marshy terrain. The headquarters hotel, a prominent landmark, is visible at the upper left, and small frame buildings line Front Street, or as we now call it, Main Avenue. The Northern Pacific built a headquarters hotel across the tracks from the depot to house its offices, employees, and their families. It was depot and baggage room, ticket and telegram office, as well as hotel. The headquarters hotel was the center of Fargo's commercial and social life. The building burned in 1874, but was immediately rebuilt and reopened with a grand ball 90 days later. In 1883, a final spike was driven into the Northern Pacific track near Gold Creek, Montana completing the line to the west coast. There was a grand celebration all along the route. In Fargo, five carloads of evergreens and 45 acres of oats and wheat were used for the decorations. The excursion train carrying General Grant and other dignitaries was greeted by music and speeches when it paused in Fargo. The hotel survived the 1893 fire, but burned in 1897. It's glory long gone, said the local paper, quote, the headquarters hotel is no more after standing many years as an eyesore to Fargo. It has at last met the fate so many have wished for and been raised to the ground. The amazing skill of a few pioneer photographers has preserved a vivid picture of life in early Fargo. F. J. Haynes, official photographer for the Northern Pacific and for Yellowstone Park, 
opened his studio in Moorhead in 1876. In 1879, he moved to Fargo, which was his headquarters until he moved to St. Paul in 1889. Pictured here is the F.J. Haynes Studio, and was located on the southeast corner of the intersection of Front Street, or as we now know it, Main Avenue, and the present 8th Street. The Haynes Palace Studio Car, operated throughout the Northwest from 1885 to 1905, was the first and only photographic studio in a railway passenger car. A newsman wrote, No gilt encircled, gold emblazoned circus car can compare with this paragon of brilliant beauty. Flatten Studio, which opened in Moorhead in 1879 and operated until 1929, took many of the fire and flood photographs on exhibit. These pictures were made from the original glass negatives, some over 100 years old. A view of Northern Pacific Park on Front Street, or Main Avenue. The park was east of the present Northern Pacific Depot building. Broadway, looming north. 1889, decorated for a fireman's tournament, which always attracted large crowds. At the right is the base of a 160-foot lighting tower erected in 1882, topped by arc lights reflected downwards. Other towers were added, but after they had been blown over twice, they were replaced in 1890 by lights on poles. Here is Front Street, or as we now know it, Main Avenue, looking east, decorated for the fireman's tournament in 1889. The 1893 fire started at the far east end of this block. Front Street or Main Avenue looking west. This block between Broadway and 7th Street escaped the destruction in the 1893 fire. The Waldorf Hotel was built on this site of the earlier Sherman House. Fargo prided itself on having more places of amusement than many eastern cities. In 1893, Fargo had an opera house seating 900 people, a roller skating rink, 25 by 200 feet with reception rooms, reading rooms, and dressing rooms for ladies, a theater seating 600, and a 50 by 200 foot building which housed the ice rink. The maidens pulling the wagon are heading west on the 600 block of Front Street, or Main Avenue, in a fire festival parade. Notice the cedar block paving. Volunteer firemen organized into hose companies hauled equipment to fires until the city council bought a team of horses in 1887. Teams from these hose companies competed regularly with each other and with teams from other cities in firemen tournaments. These great social events featured contests in skills such as hose laying and ladder climbing. Fargo was also a quick divorce center for two decades. North Dakota law required only 90 days residence to obtain a divorce, and Fargo was especially appealing because of its good rail connections and excellent accommodations. The divorce colony added a glamorous note to Fargo's social life, since many of its members were wealthy and sophisticated. Pressure from indignant North Dakotans forced legislature to pass a law in 1899 requiring a full year's residence for a divorce, putting an end to a lucrative tourist business. On the afternoon of June 7, 1893, fire broke out behind a frame store at 512 Front Street, or Main Avenue. Fanned by a south wind gusting to 50 miles per hour, the flames jumped Front Street. Soon, 200 buildings were blazing simultaneously. When the smoke cleared, 160 acres lay in ashes, and 31 blocks of business buildings and houses had been destroyed. The loss was estimated at between three and five million dollars, Insurance payments spurred rebuilding in spite of the panic in 1893, and within a year, 246 new buildings had been erected. A new Fargo arose from the rubble. Debris was used to level downtown Fargo so the streets could at last be paved with cedar blocks. By November 1883, a local paper reported, quote, Fargo is being made the handsomest city in the Northwest. Broadway is the most beautiful street west of Minneapolis, unquote. After the heavy snowfall during the winter of 1896 to 1897, 
With record 20 to 30 foot snow drifts, the Red River crested in April at 40.9 feet, the highest level ever recorded in Fargo. Because the Big Slough drainage area just west of the city had been blocked by Northern Pacific side tracks, Cheyenne River waters joined the overflowing red to flood Fargo's south side. Much wooden paving installed after the 1893 fire popped out and was replaced by brick paving. Through stock conversion deals, large tracts of land were obtained from the Northern Pacific for as little as 16 cents an acre. Dalrymple Farms and the Amenia and Sharon Land Company, two of the largest bonanzas, were in Cass County near Amenia and Castleton. The treeless, stoneless, fertile prairie was ideally adapted for the use of new machinery which was just appearing. The bonanzas became demonstration farms, and visitors from all over the United States and England came to see and write about these mechanized farming operations, the largest in the world. The first telephones in North Dakota were on the Dalrymple and Grandin farms. President Hayes came to the valley in 1878 on a special excursion train to tour the Dalrymple Bonanza. A visitor counted 79 plows, 55 harrows, 24 cedars, 28 self-binding harvesters, six steam threshers, and 40 wagons on one division of the Dalrymple Grandin Farm in 1878. In 1884, Dalrymple had 32,000 acres in wheat and 2,000 in oats. The wheat raised on the Bonanza farms was the famous number one dark, a hard spring wheat with splendid bread-making qualities, which converted Americans from dark bread to white bread eaters. 